we do want to recognize that for educators, it is really important to uh, deal with the children as individuals. We're going to work on reviewing the impact of COVID-19 and steps to cope with uh, its appearance and what uh, if impact it had on children. We'll talk about children in general and what we know about that process. And then we will also work on talking about what we have information on with regard to uh, kids with ADHD. Then we're going to work on some suggested guidelines to be applied to children individually. Uh, we are going to come up with ideas that are talking about kids with ADHD in general, but we do want to recognize that for educators, it is really important to uh, deal with the children as individuals. What we have learned, and there has been information that's been gathered from settings around the world and studies around the world uh, since the beginning of the uh, appearance of COVID, and what has been found is that uh, documented indications are that children have increased levels of anxiety with concerns that the children have primarily about health and safety, and that these anxiety concerns have mostly been uh, the kids' anxiety and concerns for the health and safety of other family members. In general, they have a, the children have been a little bit concerned about themselves, but they really have been tuned into the fact that uh, COVID does seem to affect older persons than children and that they have been mostly concerned about their um, safety of their family members. This has been especially true for young children um, who have a real concern about making sure that the people that care for them are available and can continue to care for them. Uh, it's also been found that uh, children have had a higher level of irritability, which has been something that has affected their sleep and um, has also um, been affected in addition by sleep. So if the kids are uh, being a little bit more irritable during this time period uh, compared to other time periods, that it uh, does affect their sleep. But then in turn, uh, because they're not getting enough sleep, they become a little bit more irritable. So it's been found that this has been similar to other kinds of stress is a bit of a circular relationship that's a concern. When a children have have the opportunity to return to school, uh, there has been an increased uh, in reluctance to return to school with more children, uh, having a reluctance to return to school uh, with more separation concerns. And again, with this COVID uh, episode in the United States and other settings as well, with all the uh, talk about people passing away and uh, documenting that that has happened, uh, this has resulted in more children having separation concerns and being worried about uh, people's, again, health and safety when they're in the school building. The, uh, the children, because of isolation from peers and isolation from the school setting, uh, there has been a documentation that children uh, have been feeling isolated and that there has been having increased feelings of loneliness uh, that in turn uh, has been having um, an increased in influence on uh, feelings of depression, and in some ways, um, flatness, that the kids are just feeling like they're not um, as emotionally lively as they would have been under other circumstances. Children have also reported that they've had a reduced sense of purpose and that um, in, uh, in this process, they've been focusing primarily on play as a way of coping with things, as a way of dealing with things. And um, that has been something that many people have had some concerns that the children, because they're focusing on play so much, uh, and that they're not in school in the same way that they had been before, that there's been reduced opportunities for children to re develop what's been described as grit, or really the self-regulation of behavior, the ability to kind of go and work through things even though they are difficult, and that there's been perhaps a reduced capacity for the kids to engage in focused attention uh, that they might require to be in the school setting. Children may have also had um, uh, less practice in problem-solving skills. Because they're not interacting with as many other children, 
because they haven't been interacting in ways with um, many different situations as opposed to being at home for a period of time with a kind of a predictable set of people uh, that the children may not be developing the same kinds of social problem solving skills that they would have developed in the school setting. And we think that there may be a situation where the, uh, there's indications that the children uh, may be uh, less effective at having uh, in, uh, social interactions that are uh, effective when good times as well as bad times. And there's concerns about that and that that has resulted in some increased social skills deficits. There's also been a concern that uh, children have been getting involved with much more use of the internet. Uh, there's been concerns that uh, some kids might be in the position of almost being addicted to the internet because that's been such a, a source of both education as well as entertainment during this time. Um, and um, that in fact, uh, it may be a situation where the kids are in a position of um, not, um, sorry, uh, of kids not being able to um, manage the uh, risks that are associated with heavy internet use. And there are documentation that some children, not the majority, but a good number of children uh, do get involved with um, some internet uh, addiction that results in depression as they look at what's going on around them and begin to compare themselves to other kids who look like they're having a much more lively and fun life uh, and that there has been indications when kids get a heavy use of uh, the internet that they also have a lower level of self-esteem because of these comparisons with other people. Uh, for some family situations, unfortunately, uh, kids in general, uh, it's believed that they've probably been exposed to increased violence uh, and then uh, unfortunately also increased incidence of abuse. Uh, family members have been pretty stressed during this time. Uh, family members may be in situations where they're underemployed or unemployed, uh, having worries and concerns about income, uh, and that that's uh, uh, settings that often result in a kind of fueling of uh, the potential for domestic violence and the opportunity for abuse. And again, when we do talk about that, we'll talk about some different issues with regard to ADHD in that regard as well. The uh, Just to understand a little bit more briefly about the nature of a attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, as a reminder for everyone, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a condition that's seen throughout the age range from children to adults. It is a, a pattern of uh, persons having difficulties with uh, the use of attention, with the use of uh, controlling behavior. So there's a little more um, excessive behavior in terms of the form of hyperactivity, and there's a more impulsiveness at developmentally inappropriate levels that are causing some functional impairments. So uh, that's the characteristics of children, uh, middle childhood kids, and teenagers with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, is that they are having trouble with controlling their attention. They have some control uh, difficulties with their behavior, and they have some control difficulties with regard to how they make decisions and getting involved with impulsivity. And when investigated, uh, there have been some uh, mental health trends that have been found uh, during the COVID epidemic that comes from a number of different studies uh, that have been conducted in the last two years or so. Um, it's been found that parents rating their children in a study of kids in China, uh, where there was a really significant lockdown after the uh, um, disease was found there where uh, families were not really able to leave their apartments for long periods of time and kids were certainly not in school. Uh, parents did report that 55% uh, of parents said in this one study that uh, their children were showing little, uh, a little worse or very much worse levels of con attention control uh, during the pandemic. Um, they especially reported that there was an increase in anger frequency that they noticed 75% of parents said that that was something that was present. And they also found that the kids were more likely to have difficulties with um, keeping a routine, uh, such as a bedtime routine in particular. In addition, there's been indications that the children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, again, during normal times, do have increased mental health issues compared to neurotypical children. But um, these were also increased risks that were found to be present for kids uh, during the COVID time period as well. In one study from the United Kingdom, 
uh, kids with general neurodevelopmental disorders, they were reported by parents to have a higher prevalence of emotional problems, a higher prevalence of conduct problems, and a reduced pro-social behaviors. There was another study in addition to the one in, in, in China that talks about the issues of keeping routine, uh, that kids are having uh, more problems with sleep hygiene, and that the kids with ADHD were demonstrating that more than the children uh, that had uh, neurotypical development. Another thorough study with adolescents uh, that was conducted found that um, the kids, and this was a longitudinal study where they did have information before COVID, and they then continued to track the, these teenagers into the time period after COVID. Um, they, uh, the kids were documented as having increases in, atten in inattention, increases in their sluggish cognitive tempo, um, more uh, prevalence of depression and anxiety, and more oppositional responses uh, during the lockdown. But what was interesting in this one study, this group of children and teens was a group of persons that did get involved with um, being able to do more things in the summer of 2020. And what it was found is that some of these responses then lifted when kids were coming out of the lockdown and when things had been clearing up some last summer. With the emergence of the lockdown, again, these authors uh, were thinking that um, when things returned in 2021 and with the possibility of more lockdowns occurring, that the, uh, it's likely that these uh, teens with ADHD might return to having these more problems that they had beforehand. And what's also been found in another study that was conducted in Turkey, it found that um, some children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder did demonstrate, like some neurotypical children, uh, to have a traumatic response to COVID and the consequences of COVID in their area. Uh, and that the uh, traumatic symptoms that they demonstrated was that they had intrusive worries that they just couldn't stop having. Uh, and that these uh, children also were involved with really avoiding the topic and avoiding situations that were related to COVID. And they, um, when the kids did have that and the children with ADHD, if they did have that kind of reactivity uh, to COVID, uh, it was found that that uh, resulted in an increased level of irritability and that contributed to a fair amount of family conflict. So we kind of see a theme here. We see a theme of increased anxiety. We see a theme of uh, more difficulties with paying attention effectively. And we also see more difficulties uh, with regard to um, irritability and the kids themselves uh, demonstrating some difficulties with responding to situations because of uh, irritability. We also know that children got involved with um, having some academic issues that have been documented. Uh, there have been a number of different studies looking at what has happened with children in general. So kids in general, when studied uh, during this time period in the United States, it's been found that children have demonstrated a reduction in growth in math and reading. Um, depending upon the status of their reading skills and their mathematical skills, uh, it has been found that uh, the children just haven't advanced in the way that would have been expected. Now, with kids that had already learned to use mathematics and also learned to read, uh, this means that they did not necessarily go backwards. Uh, but when we do talk about kids in the young grades, kindergarten and first grade, uh, because of the limited growth in math and reading, they may have actually gone backwards in some fashion, and they certainly may look like they have uh, um, gone back to a level that would be before they entered school. Um, the, uh, the, they also demonstrated, and there's been problems with impaired behaviors that are required for, for learning, being a receptive uh, learner, so that the kids were found to be uh, generally more restless, not ready to kind of sit at desks and work uh, in that regard, not be ready to kind of like listen to a teacher's uh, instructions and uh, being able to kind of manage uh, sitting in a classroom effectively. And there has been found uh, troubles with impairments in organizational skills uh, and also especially responding to the demands that were placed on kids when they were in complete lockdown from school and schools being presented entirely virtually. Now, what we know about kids afflicted with ADHD, uh, it's been found that they, compared to other children, have had more problems with growth in not only, their, in not only math and reading, but also their knowledge. 
so that this is a this is a common concern with kids with ADHD that they often do miss a lot of the information that's presented with regard to facts and um, understanding how to carry out procedures, such as how to read effectively, such as how to use reading comprehension strategies, such as how to do mathematical procedures, uh, but at the same time also uh, such as being able to uh, know how to write effectively. Uh, and that this impact of limited growth on kids with ADHD is greater than the kids that are neurotypical. And there's also been an indication that both handling um, any form of virtual school, but then also getting ready for coming back to the classroom, uh, kids with ADHD are believed to have higher likelihood of having problems with organization, time management and planning, which we know from our research and research by other studies as well, that um, these are really critically important skills for kids making academic advances. Now, some of the reason why we might encounter these things has a lot to do with the nature of issues with regard to online learning. And I'll come back to the other slide because we wanna be able to think about what's like with online schooling compared to in-person schooling. And these comparisons are important. In, um, and there's advantages and disadvantages for each of these differences, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, but when students um, were online schooling, um, they were often able to set their own schedules, especially in many cases during the spring of 2020, that the children were uh, presented, schools were really scrambling to try to be able to work on a way to um, help kids uh, get their education. And schools often had to work in a way and teachers often had to work in a way to present kids with assignments and have some drop-in periods to work with them, but not really engage in a lot of online education and instruction with, uh, with lectures and, and other things like that. In this situation, many kids were able to set their own schedules. They were able to see uh, that they have certain assignments that they were supposed to complete by, by, by the day that they were supposed to turn them in. And they often can kind of go ahead and say, well, I'm gonna determine in what order I'm gonna do this work and when I'm going to do it. Uh, it was also possible in this situation and continuing the home uh, that the kids could often they choose a variety of locations for doing their work. And we do think that in some cases, uh, the children receive significant parental monitoring and support. So that oftentimes in this educational setting, the child to adult ratio uh, was rather low. There were these issues where the kids had limited interactions with peers and the kids had limited interactions with their teachers as well. We compare that to in-person schooling and we have a situation where teachers generally set the schedule and they determine the order in which things are going and how long uh, students will be working on different activities. Um, the teachers and the school demands uh, often select the location where the student should be and how long the, should be, the student should be in that lake location. And teachers in, in all the different kinds of classrooms from elementary to middle school to high school are involved with monitoring and supporting a large number of students the child to adult ratio in this case is actually high. Peer interactions are more frequent and te teacher interactions are more frequent as well. And when we look at each one of these, both methods and their dif differences have advantages and disadvantages that are often based upon the individual differences. And I think we have to keep this in mind as we move forward. For online schooling, with regard to advantages and disadvantages, um, for some students and some children that I know of particularly in some of the work that we did clinically and in our research as well, there were some students that really enjoyed being able to set their own schedule. They found that they liked being able to pick how long they worked on something and in what order they did it. We even had some students that we heard about, kids that were somewhat reluctant about attending school in general, uh, sometimes reported that they did not like school that much, that they were actually getting up and uh, starting to do their schoolwork as long as it was listed uh, at five in the morning because they liked getting it done. They liked being able to move on to being able to be, have free time later in the day. The students could also uh, choose a variety of locations. This had an advantage and a disadvantage uh, at home that sometimes it was hard for parents to keep their kids on the computer and there where the instruction was occurring. Uh, and so they often had trouble keeping their children away from playtime and play areas. But at sometimes for some children, this ability to move around and this ability to change location, not have to sit in a specific desk was something that they found beneficial and easier to work through. 
the significant parental monitoring. Many kids found this helpful, however, not necessarily because a lot of parents then became concerned and they started to see that their children really truly did have some pretty significant attention control problems and became a little frustrated with that. So there were often a little bit more family conflict. The limited interaction with peers, in some cases that's good, in some cases not so good. For children that have some issues with regard to uh, in the classroom, paying attention when there's peers all around, they might have had some advantages. Uh, but in uh, recess time and other social times, they might have had some disadvantages. Interactions with teachers being reduced was generally perceived as being a disadvantage uh, for the children. And also, uh, what was really generally a disadvantage was that students didn't have an educational expert uh, guiding their school-related activities. So parents were kind of given the role of being a monitor of the kids and also being involved with some aspect of making sure the kids were doing their work and answering questions without necessarily the educational uh, background uh, and experience that the teachers bring to the bring to the table. In-person schooling, um, it, can be a, a, it can be an advantage for teachers to set the schedule. Again, sometimes it can be a disadvantage for some kids with ADHD. They have a little bit of trouble fitting into that schedule and, and the rigidity of that. Being in a select location and staying at a certain desk or a certain table uh, can be difficult for some kids with ADHD. Uh, but in some cases, again, uh, where a a, a adults around them and, and kids around them are kind of like saying, this is where you should be, this is where you should stay your focus, that might be an advantage for some kids. The teachers monitoring and supporting a large number, uh, again, uh, there can be some advantages of that because children can see how other children are behaving and they can uh, often be concerned about making sure that they behave in a similar way. So that might be sometimes an advantage for some kids with ADHD because it might keep them a little bit more focused, a little bit more uh, involved with being less restless. Um, peer interactions being more frequent, advantage, disadvantage. Advantage is that they have more social context. Disadvantage, if kids are having some difficulties with their peers and they can be more often, again, kids with ADHD, the object of teasing and some aspects of bullying. Uh, children uh, having more teacher interactions, uh, in some cases, uh, the kids not saying that this is something that uh, is a desirable reaction, but uh, some kids with ADHD have some trouble getting along with teachers and get a little bit irritated by having interactions with teachers. But it clearly a distinct advantage of having kids in the school setting and in um, online education where the teachers are uh, significantly involved, it is better for having an educational expert guiding kids online uh, in their school time activities. And now if we go back a couple of different things with regard to thinking about what's coming up, um, if kids uh, are beginning to come back to school or if they only came back to school toward the end of the school year, there's a number of patterns that we're concerned about. There's a, there's a situation that is known about in uh, memory and learning that uh, people can learn and engage in behaviors based upon the setting. It's called uh, stimulus-dependent learning. And behaviors and behavior chains can become tied to specific cues from the environment. So, uh, for example, we find that memory research has, again, indicates that learning and recalling information can be tied to a particular location. There's even indications that suggest that if you are involved with studying for something and studying for a test, that in fact, it is best to actually study in your home or in your apartment or whatever you are um, in several different settings in that place, because then your learning kind of stays with you as opposed to being tied to uh, the white wall that you're looking at or the chair that you're sitting in. Um, and uh, so many experts in, in the areas of learning and, re and, and recall suggest that you learn things in a couple of different places. Well, the reason why I bring this up is that kids may have uh, learned if they had attended school previously, uh, again, some kids in kindergarten and first grade have not attended school before uh, this coming school year um, because of the pandemic, that um, the kids may have learned some actions and learned some behaviors that have been primarily tied to their desk at home, their, their study area at home. And they may not be bringing out the same behaviors and ready to do so uh, in the classroom setting. And this fact in general can influence the skills that kids 
and teens use for coping with ADHD in the classroom. For children starting second grade, they may not have learned how to cope with inattention. They may not have learned how to cope with hyperactivity and impulsivity in a flu classroom setting. Uh, if they did go to school, they might have gone to school with fewer students than, than usual or in a classroom setting at all. Again, even perhaps for some kids that are starting first grade, some kids starting kindergarten, um, they may not have had the experience of um, recognizing that they've gotten a little feedback that says, my attention does wander. How do I cope with that? Um, I'm a little bit restless. My teacher would like me to be um, a little bit more staid and, and in one setting. How do I cope with that? Um, the other kids don't like it when I call out. The teacher doesn't like it when I call out. How do I cope with this you know, feedback? What do I do to be able to come up with these coping strategies for these issues that are tied to ADHD? For kids that are older that have been in the school setting before, but then been out of school for a long period of time, um, they may have become um, well practiced with managing these uh, strategies for coping with these issues uh, in a virtual learning setting, but they may have to bring back these skills to be able to get themselves ready for um, uh, the classroom because they may have become uh, dormant or less fluent in bringing out these coping strategies for dealing with this condition uh, in the new in the classroom setting again. So we're talking about kids either learning or relearning skills as being one of the challenges that are coming up. Now, in terms of suggested guidelines for educators, uh, there's a couple of different things that we think make a lot of sense. And there are some resources that are available that talk about these things where educators and experts have been uh, trying to get to this uh, concern. Um, I am not an expert in education, I should point out. I, am, I, I understand ADHD, but so please take these suggestions with a grain of salt. The one thing that we want to be able to recognize in general with regard to understanding ADHD overall is that many children may be coming back showing because of increased irritability, because of getting ready for a, a new setting or um, getting familiar with a setting again, um, that a good number of kids may show a number of indications of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in the classroom setting. Kids may be less attentive than they had been before, and it may take a while for things to settle in. Uh, kids and teenagers all throughout the age range may be more restless and may have a hard time, again, sitting in a classroom setting and staying there for the you know, 45 minute time period or for the entire day, and they may show a fair amount of restlessness. In terms of impulsivity, with regard to calling out, with regard to talking in class, um, the, uh, the kids may be showing more impulsivity and uh, not fitting in with the kind of guidelines that the teachers will have for how they're supposed to behave in that classroom setting. So a good number of kids may be showing indications of uh, these inattentive, hyperactive, and impulsive behaviors, but not necessarily uh, demonstrating the disorder. So it's going to be important to be cautious in interpreting actions in the beginning of this school year. When you're dealing with children and wondering about a child that might be having some issues with regard to attention deficit disorder, some children may be known to you. You may find out information as an educator that this child clearly has been diagnosed as having attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. But I also should caution and say that um, many children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder are not officially identified. We do talk about the ideas that there's an overdiagnosis of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, but in fact, there's an underdiagnosis of this condition. There are many children that have this condition that do not get a formal diagnosis, and we want to be able to have that uh, be something that you tune into. Um, just because um, you, ha you uh, are, haven't been informed that a particular student uh, has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder doesn't mean that the child does have it. And uh, just like has been recommended to teachers and educators and other people within the school system, as with other children, what's being advised right now is to be on the alert for indications of emotional distress, especially in particular anxiety and dysphoria. Kids looking really discouraged and flat, kids looking really quite anxious. Those are some of the things that are more likely to be seen at this time. We, As I indicated before, I think it's a good idea for teachers to be ready for some early conduct difficulties. The kids are getting back into the routine. 
uh, they may have been absent from the school setting, not over just the summertime, but absent from the school setting for possibly 18 months. Uh, and so it's a long process where it might be a while for them to kind of get themselves settled back down. Be prepared for early reductions of attention uh, and be prepared for uh, kids demonstrating uh, problems in getting organized and adapting to the school routine. Um, be prepared for looking for social problems with kids possibly being more isolated and more awkward and more quiet than they should be uh, that would be desired or kids getting to be uh, involved with some difficulties with other peers or again also getting involved with too much social contact during lesson time. It's been recommended again that teachers be uh, on the watch for children and a lot of um, responsibility has been handed to teachers. Uh, we have uh, in the mental health field we've asked teachers to be uh, more watchful than in the past and with this COVID uh, concerns there's even more concern and more recommendations that said teachers please be on the alert please be ready to provide extra support to the students uh, be not just an educator but also be an emotional support um, and what I think that that requires is that for administrators it's really important to provide as much con uh, guidance and as much support as possible for teachers to really make sure that the teachers are getting the supports they need to be able to provide education but also be on the lookout for some of these mental health issues. Um, and what we think that's really important for uh, administrators is to help teachers primarily be educators. Let them be the ones that provide instruction to the kids. There's a lot of gaps that have to be made up uh, during this time. Um, and help them be monitors of mental health, but kind of like don't necessarily make them be the therapists. And that does mean that for administrators as well, there should be more petition because there is considered to be concern of more mental health problems that, that they petition for getting more increased mental health support to really be assertive and, and advocate for getting more mental health services uh, within the school system. For teachers, the recommendation is that it's a good idea for using the best practices at high octane level. You know, you know about the good teaching methods, you know about the best practices overall, kind of really go at them and, and be ready to use them. Um, we think it's really important uh, for kids from the mental health perspective to really foster predictable routines, again, and help students get and stay organized. Help them get into the pattern of the school and, and the school day and children all throughout the age range uh, and with uh, mental health challenges or typical kids generally do like having a routine and knowing what's going on. It does help them be uh, settling down. And we do think it's really important to continue to engage in appropriate positive behavior supports, to focus a lot on what the kids are doing right, and to have some problem solving in place for when there are problems that develop, but to really be focusing a lot on uh, positive behavior supports to bring out the desired behaviors. Now, um, for the best practices for coping with ADHD, um, we think that these are generally good ideas for, for working with kids with ADHD in the classroom. Again, all throughout the age range. These are not just for young kids. Um, to, to kind of work on attending to the desired responses. What kinds of actions do you wanna see in class? And if there are inappropriate actions attend, occurring in the class, if the teenagers are talking too much, uh, if they're uh, getting involved with you know trying to pull out their phones when they're not supposed to or doing some different things like that. Um, really work on prompting the appropriate behaviors and trying to focus as much of your attention as possible on the positive behaviors. And um, being able to be involved with the process of ignoring minor misbehaviors and not getting too wrapped up in them. Uh, it's been found that uh, unfortunately uh, kids with ADHD when they're having some difficulties with their behavior. Uh, a small number of kids, you know, there can be two kids in a classroom with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's been found that when teachers are not careful, um, that they can provide those children with 30% of their time and often focusing on the negative behaviors that they're demonstrating. And unfortunately, uh, people, not just kids, but people in general, are attention sponges. When attention is directed their way, 
they are more likely to bring out those same behaviors and uh, continue those behaviors. So we want to be able to make sure that you're working on attending and paying attention primarily to the desired responses, to work on prompting them often, praising them often, and again, even in high school. Teenagers often say that the adults ignore them, and they sometimes want that, but sometimes they really do like getting a little bit of attention and a little bit of praise for what they do. If there are problem behaviors that are fueled by emotional distress, such as frustration, such as anger, anxiety, or discouragement and, and dysphoria, um, we think it's a really good idea to kind of validate the child for having the difficulty, kind of acknowledge if you can and have the opportunity to say, you know, look, I see that you're really frustrated by what's going on. I see that you look really nervous about this. Don't have the kids um, be thinking that they can't have these emotions. Acknowledge and validate those emotions. It makes them feel better. But at the same time, and at the same time, state the expected the expectations for appropriate reactions. Um, I see that you're really frustrated, uh, and um, it is. I'd like you to do something besides tear up the paper. Can we bring out another worksheet and have you work on that worksheet? And or can we have you see about uh, kind of taking a quick little walk to the water fountain, doing something in response to this frustration that is appropriate and helps you cope effectively with it. If you're really kind of anxious about uh, math and you're really kind of concerned that you've become behind in math and the other kids and you don't want them to see that, um, please um, engage in a kind of appropriate behavior instead of misbehavior or being like the class clown as a way to divert attention away from uh, you showing that you don't know what you're doing. Uh, so work on validating the emotions. And we also think it's really important, and this is a bias that I have because of the work that I do with, with ADHD and organizational skills. Um, we want to think about facilitating an organized classroom to help kids with ADHD cope with the school setting as much as possible. Uh, we think it's really good for doing this, through, again, throughout the age range. And whatever vehicle you use, make assignments clear and provide the time for students to be able to record the information on the details. Uh, this is often a challenge in middle school and high school settings when teachers are wanting to teach a lot and uh, the bell rings and the kids have to rush off, where teachers sometimes get involved with saying, oh, wait, just at the last minute, here's what your assignment is. Um, or uh, where teachers don't necessarily uh, keep up with Google Classroom or whatever version there is for online information. Uh, try to make th this an advantage for your students by making sure that you have they have easy access uh, to and knowing what the assignments are. Make sure there's pre, pre um, provide easy access to instructional materials and materials for assignments. And this includes both papers as well as electronic versions. Uh, try to help the students be able to know what websites they need to go to to be able to get to certain assignments and have them keep a record of what those websites are and suggest that they get involved with the process of um, also um, uh, also um, knowing what their own passwords are and provide recommendations on how to be a good user of electronic materials. Um, it can be helpful to provide students with an expected amount of time to complete an assignment. And also, um, you want to help students complete a schedule for completing assignment. If you do give a long-term project in high school or middle school, uh, it's not necessary to say that the students have to meet certain deadlines and they have to turn things in at a certain time, but you can give them a, a recommend, recommendation for when they should have their research done, when they should have their outline ready, when they should be producing their first draft. Um, or in the case of getting ready for a test, talking to them and giving them advice that would say, you know, this is a large test. There's a lot of material to go over. Perhaps we want to spend a day going over your notes. Perhaps you want to spend another day uh, and evening going over the assignments that we did. Uh, perhaps you want to spend another time going over quizzes and then getting a, a sort of a practice test for yourself. Um, it can be helpful for students to develop a plan for long-term projects and test preparation. And when you do notice that kids are having some academic issues or some behavior issues, provide referrals for students that need more support and help make that understood. And with regard to this, in, in terms of issues around attention that you've noticed, um, we want to be able to make sure that all educators know that 
um, it's important that whenever kids are showing issues with regard to attention, uh, it is appropriate for schools to get involved with conducting an evaluation to see if services would be appropriate. The students do not need to have a diagnosis that's completed by someone outside of the school system of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder to receive supports and be appropriate for those supports. Additionally, if you hear about students having a great deal of difficulty with attention, and it's not necessarily happening at school, um, it has also been determined by the US Department of Education that those students, if you hear consistent reports that they're having trouble getting homework done and doing other assignments within the time frame, and they're having a real trouble with their attention in the home setting on weekends and in the evening, that even though it's not happening at school, uh, it is still a child that warrants a review for possible interventions and supports. Um, this is a, something that came out in July of 2016 uh, with regard to understanding the nature of attention uh, concerns. And there's a, there's a link there at the bottom of this slide uh, for how to be able to get this information, what these guidelines were, especially directed at school systems. Um, I have a, a brief set of uh, resources that I'm going to place and uh, remind there's some different things that there's three COVID-19 uh, handbooks that are presented for educators from the U.S. Department of Education. Uh, number one is, is working on safety. Uh, number two is, uh, and, and number, uh, um, number one talks mostly about high school. Uh, volume two talks about um, the, uh, the work that's done for all students and how to meet their needs. And volume three uh, has a lot to do with um, higher education and college. In addition, there is a good resource for educators and persons concerned with mental health overall. Uh, the UCLA Mental Health School Mental Health Project uh, has a number of things that talk about dealing with COVID at this point in time. And our own Child Study Center here at the NYU Langone Health Center has a number of different COVID resources that we put together primarily in 2020, but they still apply in many cases. It's a kind of a good idea to see about preparing for the worst, but hope for the best. And I think we want to be careful with, um, we don't want to miss things. We don't want kids to be involved in a situation where we are not taking into account some of the struggles that they're having. But I also think we want to be able to recognize that children are incredibly resilient in many cases and that they can respond to crises pretty effectively, sometimes a lot better than adults. Uh, and we don't want to be in a situation where we're excessively pessimistic about what's going to be happening. Um, I'm reminded about some information that we had in the New York area uh, that um, comes out of responses to something that's a big anniversary is coming about 9-11. There were many predictions after 9-11 within the months afterwards and even the year afterwards saying that many people, many children, uh, will be suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, especially in the New York area, and um, especially uh, families affected by what had happened to the Pentagon as well. And follow-up studies actually indicated that the rate of post-traumatic stress disorder within children, within teens, within adults as well, was significantly lower than what was predicted. And, and that was even true in the New York area. Um, it reminds us that we uh, do come through horrific situations. Uh, we do find ways to get through it. And then I think that kids are creative and we want to be making sure that we, again, do prepare and be tuned into the worst, but also work on hoping for the best. We have heard from parents and teachers that since children have been accustomed to being out of school for some time, that now they're sometimes refusing to go to school more than they did in the past. Do you have any tips on how educators can help children who refuse to resume normal school life? Well, um, yes, there, there are, that, that is um, in, in the field of child and adolescent psychiatry, a school refusal has many sources of why it's happening, um, but it's also um, an important uh, thing and it's considered to be a psychiatric emergency because kids lose so much by not being in school, especially educationally. <clears throat> uh, so 
it is important to for uh, educators um, and this can be teachers, this can be administrators, this can be also the mental health personnel within the school system to really take the time to assess what's occurring. There are a variety of reasons why kids refuse to go to school. Some of it can be they've gotten very comfortable at home. Uh, and um, sometimes you'll, you'll find a situation where um, because of this refusal and because it's, it's difficult, um, for parents to be able to get kids that are refusing to go to school to actually go. It's not an easy process if kids are really being strong about this. Um, sometimes the kids have uh, too much, too many luxuries at home during the school day. So that if a parent contacts a school and says, my child is not um, ready to come to school and I'm having troubles getting my child to get there, I do want my child to go to school. Um, we do need to investigate and maybe have to provide advice to parents to say, well, during the school day, please make sure that your home situation is very much similar to the school day. Please don't allow use of the television. Please don't allow random use of the computer for entertainment. Uh, please make only educational things available during that time. Uh, that's one thing. Um, it may be that uh, some efforts have to be made to connect the child to school as another possibility. The kids may be uh, concerned and worried about safety. Um, everybody's wearing masks. Uh, and does that, and I've heard that kids are more likely to get COVID. I'm not going to school because I don't want to get sick. I don't want to bring it home to you. And so I'm not going to go. Um, sometimes kids can be, there, there's a variety of, sometimes kids can be afraid of, of just returning to interactions with other kids. Uh, they may be uh, and the teacher, the current teacher might not know this. There may have been things that happened, again, 18 months ago, where this child became afraid to go to school because of bullying and teasing. Uh, it's a, a recommendation would be, uh, don't assume that uh, there's a single reason for this. Try to see about getting involved with some investigations and bring in um, the mental health assistance to be able to find out for some more information through interviews and understanding the situation. Once it's understood, there may be ways to be able to gradually introduce the child to the school situation, uh, help them recognize that it is safe, help them recognize that people are there to help them deal with difficulties in that setting, uh, and help them also recognize that um, if they are having some academic issues that make them reluctant to go to school, that they can get supports for improving in that regard. So mainly assess and then see about what resources you can provide to provide assistance for this problem. Many parents were stressed with the challenges of remote learning. Now, if they're going back to in-person learning, they are anxious because it may mean hearing from the teacher more often that their child is having trouble with impulse control or attention or being disorganized. Can you offer any tips to help reduce the stress for both the teacher and the parent when they're communicating any issues or concerns? Well, I think one thing overall that's really important for educators to think about um, and parents as well uh, is to really make it an effort to refrain from blaming people for this problem. I think it's a good idea to approach it as calmly as possible to, be able to say, ah, yes, I see there's a problem. Um, I recognize that there's a problem. Um, we would like our child to be less impulsive. Um, and um, you know, parents can communicate that to the child, they can communicate to that to the teacher as well. But we wanna be able to make sure that people don't say, uh, you're being a bad kid for being impulsive. I think it's really important for everybody involved when dealing with ADHD to recognize that it is a brain-based condition, that impulsivity, restlessness, and inattentiveness is being driven um, by the kid's um, brain activity and that they don't have the same kind of capacity to control these impulses, to control um, hyperactivity, to control attention as other children. And that it's parents and teachers and kids that need to work together collaboratively to say, you know, look, this behavior is occurring. What can we do to make sure it happens less often? Um, the use that we do have methods for working with this. Behavior modification methods are very effective. 
when implemented and put together. Um, kids sometimes benefit, um, and many children do, from the use of medication when these concerns are present as well. Uh, and additionally, over the last decade or so, we've been part of this, but there's a number of people that are doing this with middle school and high school kids as well. Um, there's been found to be effective ways to teach kids to improve their organizational skills uh, with evidence uh, for this being able to be effective uh, in the third through the, through the 12th grade, that there's studies and there's interventions that have been developed and available for kids that does improve uh, their organizational skills, uh, which results in improved academic productivity, academic performance, and uh, improved homework uh, behaviors, as well as reduced conflict at home, uh, and that these behaviors and these skills last. So in the regard of these different issues, there are solutions that have been tried and tested over the years, uh, and it's a good idea to kind of turn to these solutions and find people that can help implement some of these solutions. But first, we wanna stop with blaming. We wanna look at saying, let's pull together and solve a problem and let's define what the problem is and let's see what we can do about coming together with the best solutions um, as a group. Kids with ADHD often need to move and many educators have had activities that allowed for movement by all students in the classroom. However, there is now a need to keep social distancing in mind. Are there any activities that you recommend that provide movement, but also respect the need for social distancing? I would think about recommending um, some different ideas that might involve something that's been recommended to people that can't get to the gym. Um, there are exercises for doing things in your chair, and that might be something that could be uh, interesting uh, for kids with ADHD. Uh, and um, being able to facilitate that. Uh, again, even with many teachers creatively at times make uh, the child the messenger and to be able to kind of move and go to the office or to go to kind of check on a couple of other different things around the building, that often helps and that can be done with respecting social distancing. Um, we could think about, you know, talking with colleagues uh, and getting uh, creative ideas and maybe, you know, the students can be at their desks and maybe they could be involved with standing up and saying, okay, let's take a break for, you know, the crazy dance moves and let's do that right at your desk. Um, the, uh, you know, being able to do something again that might involve, and this might be wrong, social distancing um, uh, uh, might involve um, the kids being able to um, engage. Um, well, maybe not. I don't know if this is, this could be done playing catch with a Nerf ball in the classroom. Um, with, with another child and then making sure that they have hand sanitizer for dealing with that. Or they could be, uh, they could be asked to be involved with, you know, a brief game of charades. You know, uh, please, you know, show us and demonstrate for us uh, an animal. Uh, and, and so we can work on guessing what the animal is. Um, I think, again, a number of different creative ways for being able to allow the kids to do some things while at their desks uh, could be a way of being able to work that out. Again, those are these are not expert opinions. These are ideas that I think can kind of take some of this into account. 